God, you're worthy of our praise. We worship you today. Honor your name. You are loyal. Speaking of loyal, I remember when I was remodeling the house over here, it would have been 2011, 2012. I was listening to Chicago. Just happened to come on. Just Chicago, and uh, I love the, their horns and everything that they play in there. And I said, Lord, I would love to have that in my church, the horns. And just as plain as it's, and I think I even went and told Ruth, I said, and he said, you will have them. <laughs> You're an answer to prayer. You were disobedient for eight years. <laughs> uh, I'm just kidding. I'm just, I'm just kidding. But, but, he, but he is loyal. I mean, when he told me there's going to be a church, it was 18 years later. We prayed for Jesse for 17 years. I mean, it's like. He's got a whole different time frame than what we, you know, when I want something, he says he's going to give something. We expect it tomorrow, right? Yeah. Hallelujah. That's a good worship service. I feel sorry for the people that aren't here to listen to them. They take us into the high praises, the heavenly realms. Hallelujah. We worship you. We bless you. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. I had a question Tom's going to bring the message. Are you preaching on healing at all? Healing, period, or no? A form of it? Yeah. Okay, don't give your message. No, I just, I wanted to pray for Alina. And I figured if you're going to be pray, pre teaching on healing and, and whatever, I'd wait and let you. Okay, thank you, Father. So we haven't seen Alina here now for two days, two Saturdays. And uh, she's at home. I think she's watching now. So Alina, we want to pray for you. We're going to lay hands on you. Yeah, we got long hands. God got long hands. Hallelujah. We know that God is a healer. And anyone else out there in Zoom land or here that needs healing touch from God, just receive it. We receive it by faith the same way we do not earn our healing. We do not, we do, not do enough stuff. We can't be so righteous that we're automatically healed. It's all by His grace and through faith. So, Elena, we just pray over you in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach. We Come against the spirit of infirmity in the name of Jesus, whatever is causing this problem, whatever is causing this fatigue, whatever is causing, we just bind that in the name of Jesus and we command it to be gone in Jesus' name. And any other spirit of iniquity that or infirmity that, that is causing uh, discomfort, pain today, we just come against that in Jesus' name. We bind the strong man as Jesus told us to do. We render him powerless. We command him to be gone from your body. We speak strength health and life into you in jesus name jesus. it's not the same when you're not here i'm used to seeing you here so i can pick on you so we need you healthy whole in jesus name hallelujah god is still on the throne he's still the healer still the same as he was when he walked on the earth he's still doing the same thing other than him doing it now it's doing it through us. That's what he told us to do, was to go and pray for the sick and they shall recover. In Yeshua's name.
Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And if you put checks in the offering last week, what, they haven't been put in the bank because she's our banker. She does all that, so we're holding it for her. Hallelujah. I know we got a call one time from somebody that wanted to know why the check's not been in the bank, and it was only like three days later, and it's like, well, somebody's really keeping track. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, you are good all the time. I'm going to open it up. Does anybody have anything that you really feel the Lord spoke to you about this morning? Hallelujah. God's on the move. God's working. Remember that song? God's still working on me. I forget how the rest of it goes. That's yeah, a kid's song, but we're big kids, aren't we? Thank you, Father. So as we go into transition, uh, we will get ready to have Tom and pray for the people that are marching out in Plain City in this cold weather. They're parading, parading for uh, life, put an end to this abortion stuff. Roe v. Wade, I guess this is the anniversary. Uh, this time frame is the anniversary of uh, the Roe v. Wade. Thanks. Praise the Lord. I knew that my boss was going to have me out all day yesterday, so I asked Tom last week whether or not he would uh, bring the message. I usually like to have my Fridays all day to uh, ask the Lord what's happening and what's what he, I'm supposed to teach and everything. Uh, so I started on Thursdays too, but uh, he was gracious to do it, and I think we're going to start hearing more and more from Tom all the time. Amen. Let me rephrase that. I think we're going to be hearing more and more from God through Tom. Is that better? <laughs> Amen. He should write a book and put it in there. He ought to. <laughs> Actually, today, I'm, I'm just going to plagiarize out of his book. So I ha I'm going to bring you one original thing. <laughs> Mm -mm -mm. Hallelujah. Well, praise God. If anybody wants to take communion, please uh, take the opportunity right now to participate in the remembrance of his sacrifice for us. <clears throat> Man, I just can't express really right now how, how much I absolutely feel the presence of the Lord. Does everybody, everybody yeah. feel that as well? Just, oh man, he is really here. <sighs> well, I have a word for you, okay? So uh, the Lord, one of the last times that the Lord had me give you a word, he, do you remember what was said? Tell me. Well, I was about his humbleness and That's what I remember. Okay. Okay. And the, and that is absolutely correct. So that tracks right in what he has been saying to me about you and wanted me to make sure that 
that there was more that was given to you with greater clarity and understanding. You have a calling that is a calling from a particular passage of scripture, and it's Philippians 2, verse 6. Can you bring that up, Scott? The being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Can anybody shed any light on that? You know what that means? You don't have to. You don't have to. I know when I ask a question like that, I'm in teacher mode, and it just, it just makes everybody think, oh my gosh, I don't know the answer. I wonder what he's going to say. So it gets your attention, so you don't have to respond. But here's the point. <clears throat> the Lord said when, on a particular day when, when he had me prophesy over your brother and you, that your brother was being sent out and you were going to have a ministry that, was, that would highlight your failure, and that would be your ministry. That's what this is. To do you remember that word? Okay. To clarify, this is what he's saying when he says that. You're going to know your ministry. You've got things that are on the inside of you that are burning on the inside of you. You don't know how to get it out. There's places of humility and wisdom, and you are like the Lord says, you're like my little sponge, because everything that I speak, you take into your heart and you keep it there, but you don't know how to get it back out. The Lord's bringing you into a ministry and into a place through a process of time. It's not right now, it's to come. You're being downloaded a whole lot of information and a whole lot of things and life history and working things out where there's successes, there's failures in the natural, successes and failures in the spiritual. <clears throat> yours, is not, yours is not like your brother's to come into a place where you then look like you're the top of the mountain and you and you proclaim it your calling is to is to proclaim what you have heard and out of a place of i am not anything special yours is a ministry of bringing forth the glory of the lord from the places of humility let me kind of explain that even a little bit more, because this not only pertains to you, this is all of us. <clears throat> when you and I came to Christ, you and I came to Christ, everybody here in this room, not because you saw him. When we see people who are high on a pedestal, if you've got any kind of sin in your life, and you see that they're the high one, the exalted minister, the one who moves in power uh, in the world. If, you're, if you have an employer who's, who's got a lot, Bill Gates, not, not to, that's a terrible example. <laughs> I know. If, if you see somebody who has a lot of power or authority, you want to be like them. You want to be like the, if you play basketball, you, 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 you're in awe of, of Michael Jordan, you're in awe of, of other people who know how to do it very, very well. Jesus carried all of that, and that's what, he's, that's what this is pointing out. All of that is present, and all of that he, he, he uses. But you and I, in the state that we are in, can't come to the Lord and identify with him because we're here and he is here. We are not like him, and we know it. What this scripture is saying is he doesn't come to bring the kingdom of God to you and me out of a place of different identity. 
He comes in the place where he looks lower than every one of my mistakes that I've made. You got to get this. You have to get this. The reason that the cross is there in the first place is because he's made himself lower than any human on the earth. He took the place of the lowest point, the, 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 the lowest of the low, in a point of humility that nobody else could ever take. When I take a look at him then, in the place of my sin, I can identify with him because he was made sin. What the Lord is saying to you is don't be afraid to speak of the things that have been hard for you to do, hard for you to understand, because those are the places of your testimony where then you look like Jesus. You look like Jesus in the low spot. And because of that, the Lord says, because of that, my son, you will be used to greatly identify with those who are crushed in soul and spirit. And you will be used as a bridge to bring them to me and bring them to glory. Hallelujah. Is that a good word? To help clarify things? Good. It's 11 o'clock, and all is well. <clears throat> Pastor Dave's thrown down the gauntlet that I can't get you all out of here by noon. I'm going to take on the challenge. I love you. I think you're the... Man, you're berries and whipped cream. That's what you are. Today's message is going to be a little bit eclectic. So it's not going to, it's not going to flow real smooth because the Lord says that he wants to take this over today, which is just fine by me. I've got plenty to say and plenty of things, but... There's a certain thing that the Lord wants to highlight today, and I absolutely know it beyond a shadow of a doubt where he's going. So I'm going to hit on different things that, that, he has, that he has highlighted to me, and I'm just going to bring you what I've heard in the secret place. And, and we'll just let him bring it forth in any order that he wants to, and any story that he wants to, and I'll trust him that he'll, that he'll, that you'll hear the things and you'll start to identify with what's being spoken and you'll start to hear his voice, that what you're hearing is truth and the pull towards him in those things, okay? All right. Romans eleven twenty two. Romans eleven twenty two says, it "Is is this paradox? It is who God is, but it's both sides of the coin." Can you put up eleven twenty two? Romans eleven twenty two. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God. On them which fell severity, but towards thee goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou shalt also be cut off. You know, the Lord is, has been in, in the most recent season with him and me, the Lord has really been highlighting a few things uh, one of them is that, that, that I need to change from this microwave mentality of the Lord gives me a word and poof, it's going to happen. 
to the truth of what scripture is. Now, that happens occasionally, okay? Those things happen, and I don't want to discount that. But the majority of the way that God works is he speaks his word, and then we start in process towards the accomplishment of that word. The other thing that he does and wants to, and, and has been talking to me about is that, that there's a, a big co-laboring in this. It's not just him, it's him with me, me with him. In to highlight that, so, so in the garden, in the garden of Eden, he gives, so, so who planted the garden? God did. And to, to plant the garden, you basically have cultivated this garden to cause things to grow. So God is a, God, God, and he continues even to this day of, of being a cultivator. He'll take me and he'll prune me. He is growing me as a tree of righteousness. It is, I am the planting of the Lord. You and I are in his vineyard. We are the vine that he's growing. So he's a husbandman. He's in a process of, of, of growing it. What, what does he do that for? What, what's, his, what's a king's garden all about? Why does a king in ancient times, why do they make gardens? Does anybody know? Anne-Marie? That's okay. That's all right. So a king makes a garden because, because it reminds him of the places of home. It reminds him of the things that are precious to him. It reminds him, it gives him a place of, of, uh, of rest, a place where he can, where he can come and he can uh, bring his children and give instruction in the garden. It's a place that for his wife, the, the, by the way, the, the gardens of Babylon, the hanging gardens of Babylon, has anybody ever heard of those? Okay, the, in, in, in the, the hanging gardens of, of Babylon, they were one of the seven wonders of the, of the ancient world, okay? The hanging gardens. So it was an artificial mountain that was built with, with terraces in them and plantings from all kinds of things were put into there. There was shade, there was waterfalls, there was pools of water. And kings in the ancient world, in Egypt, in, in the Middle East, in they, uh, even in homes of the, of the very wealthy, they would have inner courtyards that were, that were gardens. Well, it, so it was places that were, so it, the hang, I started to talk about the hanging gardens in Babylon. They were built in Babylon because, well, there's a couple of symbols, but, but they were, uh, it was built for his wife because it reminded her of her home. Plants from conquered places would be put in the king's garden. If a king made war in a, in a different climate and culture, then, and they conquered them, they'd take some of the plants and the trees from that thing that were not native to, to where the king came from, but, but native to the place where he conquered. He'd, he'd put them in his garden and it would, be a, it would be, every time he'd walk by, he'd remember the victories that there were. Well, when we walk in the garden of the Lord, Adam and Eve, I mean, those things are basically part of what Adam and Eve were sharing. But the point of the garden. You remember, Kim Clement had a garden, did he not? Out back, he used to, that's where he used to get a lot of word from the Lord. Okay. And for people that didn't hear that, what Pastor just said is Kim Clement had a garden in the back of his home, and he would go into the garden, and that's where he got a lot of words. Well, that's actually the point of the garden. So in the garden of in the garden that there is in the narrative 
in the book of Genesis where God builds Eden and in the middle of Eden, he places a garden. In that garden, the thing that was most important to him and the reason that it was there literally is it is, it reminds him on earth of the place of his kingdom in heaven. It's exactly what it is. Let me submit to you that I could take, or I'm not gonna take a lot of time with this, but then again, there's a lot of, a lot of things that, that connect together with today's teaching that the Lord wants to bring out. You and I, mankind, were specifically made to dwell not just in Eden, but in the garden in Eden. The delight of God is in the cool of the day to come talk to his children, who are his children. You and I are his children. When Adam and Eve fell, then what happened to them? They were removed from the garden. I have a quick question. According to scripture, were they removed from Eden? And the answer to that is no. The first time that the people from Adam and Eve, the first one to be totally removed from Eden was Cain. He left Eden to go to a different place. But Adam and Eve were taken out of the garden and they went into a different place where they, where they were formed from the dust and the dust specifically was out of Eden. <clears throat> Everything, every work of Yeshua is designed to bring us back, not just into Eden, but into the garden. We, this is where the Lord is going. Now, what's the purpose of the garden? Why does God want the garden? The, the garden is the place of heaven upon earth. Mankind is supposed to duplicate what he sees there, bring, see heaven and, and the presence of God and literally duplicate that garden and cultivate it all the way through the entire world. Not just Eden, but the garden. God's delight isn't just in the garden. That's wonderful for him, but the whole highlight of what gives him total pleasure is him coming and sitting with Adam and Eve and teaching them. And Adam and Eve, when they sit with him in the garden, are just like Kim Clement, and they hear wisdom that they had no knowledge of prior to talking with him one-on-one. -on -one. Is this good so far? Okay. So communication is the whole point. When, when Adam and Eve sinned, then there was a veil that separated and they were removed from the point of his presence and the place of direct one-on-one -on -one communication with the Father. Two songs that we, two songs that we, uh, we sang today uh, that, that kind of highlighted where the Lord was is the song Loyal and the song uh, uh, I need you. But both of them pointed out a place that, that, that basically said one thing, and that is that you're the one who puts into my heart the things that need to be in my heart. Bring up second, or Colossians 2, verses 13 through 15, if you would, Scott. Two, what was the one? 
13 through 15. See, the Lord comes to us. We have, we have nothing to offer him. When Adam and Eve sinned, they were in a place where, where just as I described with, with, what, with the word here, the Adam and Eve are in a place of sin. They have an awareness that they are not worthy. And that literally is the place that the curse of Adam absolutely attacks them, and that's what's passed on generationally. If you and I are struggling at any point in time with this feeling like we are not worthy to go before the Lord, that does not come from the Lord, that comes as the curse from Adam. Jesus does away with that. That in Genesis 3, where, where, they, where Adam and Eve sin. They see themselves as low and God is high. They can't stand in that place. Yet the Father wants to come and gather them back and bring them in, back into the, into the place with, of intimacy with him. The Lord is always looking for you and I. When you and I came to the Lord, let me just speak to myself. Let me just speak for myself. So I felt the Lord coming after me. I don't know if anybody else felt that pull, but he, he came after me. And I mean, to tell you, he was like a bulldog. I couldn't get him off of me. He spoke through different people, people that were absolute tattooed up and down. This is in the, this is in the, this is 1980. 81, something like that. And people weren't tattooed like they are now, but, but people who were, who you know, should not have known the Lord. They had lifestyles. They were witnessing to me because the spirit of the Lord would come upon them and they would speak the, his words to me. He was coming after me hard. He, he filled my restaurant with Christians as employees and they were all witnessing to me. I could not get away from it. I couldn't shut it down. He was coming after me. But the thing that, the thing that, was, that was there that I did not know that was, that was there was, uh, I wanna say, oh, I've got it here. I'll we'll turn to the, We'll take you to a different place in scripture here. So in, in, second, uh, let me find it. It's second Corinthians four, four, I believe. Colossians. Corinthians. Yeah, that's it. So, so a lot of you have heard this story again, but, but so the Lord is not a, the Lord actually in teaching, he has a, he has he has a value on things being repeated because we need to hear it and then cycle it around and hear that same thing again. So, so if you hear the same message or you hear the same witness and testimony, it's fine because the Lord is highlighting something. Well, some of you know how the Lord brought me to him uh, from different times that I've told this, but I'm gonna tell it to you again. So uh, this woman who, in the process of the Lord pursuing me and coming out of the woodwork with literally everything, I mean, I, I couldn't believe it. He, he threw this woman who he brought in to be hired at this Bob Evans restaurant that I was, that I was the manager of in Clarksville, Indiana. She was so sold out. She didn't care. Any, she didn't care about. It. She talked about Jesus all the time. I couldn't get her to shut up. 
I mean, she'd talk about Jesus to me. She'd talk about Jesus to the, to the, to the, to the employees, to the people who she served. I mean, it was just like, I could not shut this woman up. She was on fire. She was, she was just plain crazy. <laughs> crazy for the Lord. Well, so this whole process had been going on for, I mean, a couple of months where the Lord is just really pushing me. And she says to me one day, she says, you know, the Lord is, Jesus literally is the only way and or something to that effect. I don't know verbatim, it doesn't make any difference, but at any rate, we are behind the counter the st where people can sit on stools and be served in the old Bob Evans, they had that right up front. And we're right behind there in the serving area, right behind that counter. Well, there's people sitting at the counter, okay? She's having this conversation with me. Now I'm her boss and she ought to kowtow to me. She ain't afraid of me for nothing because she has Jesus. And if I get fired, Jesus gonna give me another job. She don't care. She looks at me and, and says, Jesus is the only way. I said, I read books and it's got Jesus in it. And, and I know that, that I know as much of the word that you do. She says, you don't know anything. <laughs> and and I, I, I felt my head go back like this and literally my, my you know, you flush with, with embarrassment because I knew that she knew what the heck she was really talking about. She says to me, <clears throat> She says, I'll make you a bet. She says, I'll bet you can't take your Bible. Oh, by the way, do you have one? Uh, she was sarcastic too. She wasn't nice. It wasn't Jesus meek and mild. This is like a lion roaring at me. <clears throat> do you have one? Yeah, I have one. She starts to put a finger in my chest. She says, you don't know your Bible. She says, I'll bet you, and I mean, she's, she's walking towards me and her face is like this, but she's small. She's, she's down like this, but she's like, like, like that. She says, you take your Bible and you open it anywhere you want to. And you read it for 15 minutes a day for a month. No, she says, for a week. And then you come back to me after you've read it for 15 minutes a day for the week. And you tell me if what you know that you know is the same thing that you're reading in the Bible. I said, sister, you're on. You're on. I'll do that, that ain't hard. I can handle that, and I'm a reader. <clears throat> I love to read. So I thought, you're giving me no kind of task at all. I, I can read that in just a, a, a heartbeat. She says, but I'm gonna tell you something. She says, you're gonna open that book and you will not be able to read it because of 2 Corinthians 4.4. I said, what is that? Displaying my vast knowledge of the scripture. <clears throat> she says, the God of this world has literally blinded your eyes, your mind, and you have a veil over you that he will not remove so you will not be able to read those words. I said, you're on, that ain't gonna happen. Well, to make a long story short, I was diligent and did what she asked and, and to, to enter into this whole thing. I would get that book down and I would start to read the Bible, just open it randomly and I would start to read it. And I would get through three or four words and literally everything on the page would merge into a big black blob. 
I could not read it. I would start to fall asleep. I could, I, I would just, you know, things would interrupt me. It would like, it was like, the coincidence that there was a God, there was all these things proving that, it, that in, in a realm of unseen things, there was a living God who was literally there and making himself known through people. He was chasing me. I knew he was there. I could also see on the other side, there was a demonic realm and activity that I was now seeing personally, and it had me under its control. Because no matter how much willpower I put into trying to read that word, I could not get through a paragraph. And it rocked my world. I came back to her and I said, I, I, something's wrong. I, I, you're right. I, I, I don't know this and I can't do it. One but a few days later that I'm in the back room after everybody's gone and literally in the spirit, I can see him. Jesus comes walking into the office where I'm doing the final paperwork of the night for the restaurant. <laughs> Here's the point. He came to me and he was not afraid of my sin. So if you go back to, if you go back to Colossians 2, 13 through 15. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Please go to Romans chapter 5 and verse 6. For when we were yet without strength, when, you, when I was there at Bob Evans, I had no strength to come to him. Nobody that comes to him in a place of salvation has any strength to come to him. When we try to come to him, then every bit of our will is controlled and we, are, we have a veil that is put over us. We don't want to go there. We act like Adam and Eve. When he comes, we want to run and hide. The running and hiding from the presence of the Lord is the veil. It's the place of separation. I don't want him to come to see what's really in me. Makes us squirm, makes us run, makes us hide. We don't wanna see his holiness. He comes from the spot of being lowly, identifying, I'm not afraid of your sin, I've been made sin, identify with me. He becomes that bridge and then takes me up and in, into him. The thing that I leave behind is I leave a veil. And what I have is a veil now torn into from, the, from heaven towards earth. And now I'm able to come into the place of the garden of God to be able to sit with God and listen to the Father and him teaching me. Not good? For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ got, died for the ungodly. Uh, go to verse 8 of Romans 5, please. 
but God commendeth his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for me. So I don't clean myself up to come. I come to the cross and meet him in the fullness of my identity that I am not any good. And he meets me and he says, I know what that's all about. I've been there. I can relate to your life. The Lord woke me up in the middle of the night. Isn't he funny? He ought to know that he, lo he should love me and let me get my beauty sleep because Lord knows I need some beauty. But he woke me up in the middle of the night because he wanted me to make sure and communicate something that I would remember. So it's like, like one of those kind of things. Has that ever happened to you? I know it's probably happened to a, a lot of us. And this is what he says. I mean, he speaks. This is what he says. <clears throat> the process, the process should never be the point. The people should be. We can get into places where, where this book and the processes of salvation and right standing with the Lord becomes the thing and the focus. He doesn't look at it that way. The point is to bring people into the place of his presence to rejoin us in that place of his presence. Do you know what a hoopah is? A hoopah is a wedding canopy. A hoopah is where a man and a woman in the Jewish tradition stand under and basically the ceremony of marriage, the two are united as one. Actually, it, it is not just a ceremony where two are united to one. It's a ceremony where these two are united with God as one. The letter in Hebrew, the eighth letter of the alphabet, is the letter C-H-E-T, Chet. Do you know that that letter basically symbolizes a hoopah. Do you know that the hoopah is designed to look like the garden? Do you know the four posts that are on a hoopah represent the four rivers that surround Eden and, and, and border it? Do you know that that the imagery that he's presenting is so much more in the depth of it than just the surface of it? Do you know that that, that place of, of, of the garden is the place where, where in the book of Esther, it's actually <clears throat> The garden and it is actually the the holy of holies. It's it's the, it's the temple. Gar the Garden of Eden literally is set up as the temple or the tabernacle of God. Does anybody know that? Raise your hand if you know that. <clears throat> I've still got twenty three minutes. <clears throat> Oh, there's the hoopah, okay? This is literally a representation of the garden. The garden of Eden, in Eden, literally is a wedding place, a place where, two, where actually three become one. It was the place where, the, where the, the Lord himself was taking Adam and Eve and putting them together under his canopy in the house that he provided in the garden it is it is this is the holy of holies this is the place where we are actually called to be this is the place that there that the veil 
cut off. This place is the, is the representation of the tabernacle. I, I, just, just real quickly, in, in the, the tail end of the book of, or in Genesis in chapter 3, what happens when the Lord takes Adam and Eve as a, as a consequence out of the garden? He puts cherubim with flaming swords to block the way back in. If you take a look and do a little research, this doesn't take long, of the veil between the holy place and the most holy place. It is a veil that has on it two cherubim with flaming swords. The temple is Eden, but the holy of holies is the garden. The temple is, is, being, is being, so this garden place, the Lord gives a command to Adam and Eve. He says, this is mine. I formed this. This has been started, but I'm giving you a command and a purpose for your life. You now take, take and stand with me in this garden and I'm giving you the responsibility to keep it and tend it and cultivate it. Right here, we need to see something, that there is a co-participation in the whole thing. Well, what are we talking about ultimately? When we talk about the tabernacle, we are literally talking about the Garden of Eden being the, the, the tabernacle, the tabernacles re represented in, in the book of Moses. It travels through the desert, and then it becomes the temple in Jerusalem, and then the temple of Jerusalem is destroyed, and is the tabernacle then gone? No. You're the tabernacle. So if we, if we see that, that what's been actually progressing is a revelation of what's being shown in the beginning, then the Lord is, is, is showing the pattern of how to build a human being. He starts the process. You and I are the tabernacle. We house the Lord. He walks in us. The kingdom is an internal thing. It's not shown on the outside. It, the kingdom of God is within you and me. We house the presence of God. Where? In a holy of holies, literally in the garden that he has made in our heart. We're to take our heart, the place of his garden, and we're to tend our heart along with him, and we co-labor with our heart being kept correctly to build our lives in him. We sow our lives in him towards the people who are around us. My little waitress mama, spiritual mama, was connected in the garden intimately with the father and she sowed his life into me. This temple, this tabernacle is, is built in Jerusalem. It's built in Jerusalem on a threshing floor. <clears throat> The threshing floor. When, when people thresh, so the threshing floor is another image of what the work of the Lord is in your life and my life. So when you and I came to the Lord through the cross, through his work, through him being made sin 
and me entering into the, the humility of him. He tore the veil. What was the veil? The veil was my awareness that I was, no, that I was not worthy to stand in front of the Father. Now that that was torn, I feel worthy to, with no guilt, no condemnation. My soul can't create that. It can maybe for a day, because the, the Old Testament is basically trying to cover sin with the blood of bulls and goats that does not remove my guilty conscience. It, it takes care of it very temporarily, but it continually has to be done. When he removes that, when he removes the veil, he's also removing my covering of fig leaves. He's removing the places where I try to cover over my life and make myself look good to myself and to other people around me. He takes me out of that entire system. That's what you and I get when we come to him. He clothes us then, not in clothes that I possess or we possess, but he clothes us in himself. We become clothed in Christ. But there's another secret to the threshing floor, a secret to this garden. We are co-laborers with him. We come into the place where, where we are now able to stand before the Father. We, we have chaff removed from us, but now we're co-laborers. We take what he's given us and we come into the place where we labor in our own becoming who he is. Hmm. So the threshing floor, so the cross took our old man off of us, that old covering off of us, reconnected us to the father. That's the whole point. Has anybody read the book of Ruth? Ruth, have you read the book of Ruth? <laughs> so let's talk about something that's, that's absolutely his heart and where he wants to, where he's walking us to today. So Ruth was from a Moabitess. And if we understand from the story and the prior stories that there were of Moab, were the people of Moab, were the Moabites a favored people in front of God? Yes or no? No. So by his, by his word, they basically were not supposed to be a part of Israel at all. Is that correct? Yes. Not at all. So Ruth comes in and Ruth then is a picture of somebody who knows that they're bad and who even can read the scripture and get the impression that the scripture even, I'm not just thinking this myself, this word that he says, the king, the sovereign king, he says that I'm bad. How many of you have ever read the scripture and come away with the knowledge that you are bad? You Moabites, you. How many have ever come away knowing that God, 
according to who he is. He is good, but he's also severe. He will not put up with any sin. He will, the promise of the sovereign king is he will cut you off. Have you ever gotten that out of scripture? I know I have. The threshing floor. Ruth comes to the threshing floor. Boaz is there. Why is Boaz there? Because it's the time of threshing. So in the time in the ancient times when when the wheat is brought into the threshing floor and is sitting there on the floor in the open, nobody goes home. The owner of the wheat doesn't go home and leave it available for any thief that will come in the middle of the night to destroy, to take the wheat. He stays and watches and sleeps there, does not leave the threshing floor. You and I are designed, and according to this picture that he gives us, that the ultimate objective is to come into the place of the of the of the the holy of holies into the place of the true threshing floor where the chaff gets removed we come into that chaff removal at the cross at our initial salvation ruth comes and lays at the feet of boaz covers his feet. He wakes up and he says, what are you doing? And all of this thing, but basically makes this statement. Don't let, it tells all of his people, don't let anybody know that there's been a woman in this threshing floor in this room tonight. And then he starts a process of finding out who is the redeemer can, the kinsman redeemer of Ruth. Nobody claims her, he claims her. Do you know, according to the word of God, if a man lays down, not even knowing in the biblical way, knowing the woman, but if they lay down together, do you know that that makes them husband and wife? So here we have a picture of a marriage thing that's being brought in the place of the tabernacle of the of the in the hoopa in the garden where it's designed to bring two people together as one. It's a marriage. It's what drives the whole theme of scripture that two become one. Ultimately, it is me becoming one with the Lord. There's a marriage, the wedding supper of the lamb. It is, it is me being the bride. It is being restated again, that part of the, that the main emphasis of the cross of me coming to the threshing floor is for me to come into a place where I am made acceptable for my beloved. Scott, I want you to go to uh, Colossians chapter 2 and verse 6. Colossians 2 verse 6 reads this way. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk ye in him. What does that mean? That means <clears throat> that when I came to him, the way that I came to him is I came to him and I had a realization that I was not right with him. 
I came to the cross. I met him in the place where he understood and could identify with my weakness because he came and made himself weak beyond belief, dropped the title uh, or dropped the glory and majesty of his true position and met me in a place where I could identify with him. I'm a sinner. He's a sinner. I may have a chance that he understands. That's the way I came in. And he's saying to me, as I came in, that's how I'm supposed to continue. Here's the point. The place of the garden is the place where he continually meets me where he continually takes the chaff off of me. Does chaff come back on me? Yep. I'll show you. Have you ever been in a place where you know that the, that, that the, the biggest value that there is in your life and my life is the presence of God? The thing that's the most important is the pres his presence. Unless Moses says, your presence goes with us, we won't look like anything different than anybody else in the world. So the qualifying thing is his presence in our lives. But have you ever, in trying to seek a place of intimacy in the place of his presence, to go into the secret place of the Most High that you don't feel worthy. Yes or no? This is why the Lord says here, as you have received me, continue on in me. Because what we're displaying then is chaff again in our life, places of self-protection, places where I know I've blown it and now I don't want to, now I have this this stay offishness from the Father. The Father continually wants to reconnect with us, continually. But you and I can't change the heart. He continues to change the heart. The co-laboring can't be done with half of a heart. You and I have been called to be priests before the Lord. Is that correct? were to be made into a nation of priests. In, there's five books of Moses. What's the, what's the book in the middle? Leviticus. So, so literally, there, the books of the Bible are, in Moses are, there's, the, there's an, a, a book, a book, and they bracket the one that's the most important in the center. We don't look at Leviticus as being the most important one in the center, but it actually is because it's where we're called to be. It's what we're being made into. You and I are being made into priests. Because we're to minister the Lord to the world. We're the place where we know the Lord and we're supposed to be the ones that, that, that are the stand in between, between the ones who, who cannot come and, the, and he who is. We're a house of prayer for all nations. But you and I can't come to... Hmm. I'm not going to have you go there, but I'm going to give you the, I'm going to give you the chapter of, of where we are right now. So the Lord is calling us to a particular place, and I'm going to be done by 12. In Ezekiel 44, the story basically goes like this. Ezekiel chapter 44. We won't go there but, because there's a fair amount to read, but I'll encapsulate it for you. So there are, there are priests who are Levites who serve in the outer court and priests 
that are Levites that are able to serve in the inner places. The priests that serve in the outer courts are the Levites. The priest that serves in the sanctuary are the sons of Zadok. Does anybody know the scripture? You don't have to. You and I have been, if you and I, so what's the distinction between the two? The distinction between the two is this, and for application of our lives. You and I, when we come to the Lord, if we don't come continually to this place where he removes the chaff and, and brings us into a place where our heart is made right by him continually, living this walk of the cross all the time, taking that chaff away, then what we end up with is we end up with a mixture of the Lord and the world. We're not kicked out of the kingdom, but we are relegated as priests before him to minister to people in the outer courts. Now, I'm going to tell you something that's absolutely true. A lot of the church that there is, a lot of the church throughout the world, this is where people minister. And they'll, they'll, they'll minister the love of God with this acceptance of the things of the world. That's the mixture that they, and they don't, and the Lord doesn't kick them out and say, you know, out into, he'll, he, but he doesn't have them go into the place towards his presence. The sons of Zadok are a special branch of, out of, uh, the, out of the Levitical uh, priesthood that stood up for the things of God and now they have duties that are different than because the Levites can minister to the people and have a church that is full of entertainment of the world and the gospel combined. They can minister in mixture to the people that come in towards the Lord but they can't bring the full measure of his power in his presence, like the sons of Zadok. The sons of Zadok are priests that have consecrated themselves to the ways of God, that they have been authorized by God. They didn't choose this thing. The Lord said, this is who I'm choosing to do this. The sons of God are people who have consecrated themselves by coming continually and valuing the removal continually of that outer chaff and, and staying in that place of communication one-on-one -on -one with the Lord. The Lord says, they serve the people, you serve me. They minister to the people, you minister to me. The greatest value as a priest is to minister before him. The picture of the 24 elders is a picture of, pe of, of people ministering before the Lord. You and I need to understand, and the Lord wants us to understand fully, this is a thing that, that you and I have, that you have a choice in your life of where you will live. Not only that you will live here on the earth, but when you go and you die, you will be in the place of heaven, but you'll be far removed from the total place of my presence. You'll still see and be, 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 be affected by the place of my, of my presence, but you'll be, in, you'll be in the outer court. It's been your choice. We need to understand that. I may not be done by 12. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. 
the value that the, the difference between the priests of the outer court and the inner court, he states plainly in Ezekiel 44, and it basically is this. My priests, the sons of Zadok, they teach and instruct from what I have said, and they tell it like it is. This is who Ezekiel, or, or uh, um, yeah, as Ezekiel was, is, was this way. This is who John the Baptist was. This is who Elijah was. They are sons of Zadok coming into the place of the presence of God and, and setting the church into the proper order of the ways of God. And they didn't care whether they died or not. They didn't care whether they were a big church or not. They knew what the Lord was saying, and that's what they taught. But that's not the point, even though we need, the Lord wants to bring that up. The Lord is highlighting this thing that he is calling us to. It's a place of consecration. It's a place of recognizing that 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 if I, if I have anything in me that wants to stay away from his presence, you need to come to him. You can't make yourself good. He wants you as you are, imperfect. He already knows it on a daily basis, on a week, but whatever. It makes no difference how many times you feel this. He wants you to walk the same on in the kingdom, the same way you came in. He wants you to recognize what's in your heart. You're a co-participant in what's being planted in your heart. And basically, he wants me to, in a co-participation, say, oh, there's weeds in there. And if I try, I can't pull them up. But, but I'm a gardener, and I've been given responsibility to make sure that my heart is in a good and cultivated place that's pure with him. So he wants me to come with that and sit with him in the garden, face to face, because the only one that fixes the heart is him. He wants me to hear his words. He wants me to come as I am all over again to work out my salvation in fear and trembling. The same way I come in is the same way that I go on. He wants me to come and, and into the garden, into the secret place of the Most High and open my heart to him so that he sees and I see what's in there together. He's the only one who gives the authorization and permission and the power to remove what's there. I, in faith, allowing myself to be totally open and transparent with him. He then, I don't hold on to that. I've come in a place of humility where I said, Father, here is my heart. Let's, let's talk about this. The Lord will tell us where we're good, where we're not good. He is faithful. But he wants there to be no separation between him and me at any time. 
He is a jealous God. He doesn't want me to give any desire or love to anything but him, to anyone but him. But I can't change myself and put myself in this place where my willpower is strong enough to, can, to keep my heart clean. What I need is I need to stand in the place where I am able to behold him. That's my 12 o'clock timer. <laughs> So, so in, in, in asking the Lord, what do I talk about today? The Lord said, it wouldn't tell me. I mean, he literally, I was, Annette came home from work last night and I'd been working on things for a while and had pages and pages of different things. I'd been sitting in the, literally in the garden with the Lord. And the Lord had downloaded just revelation and just huge places with, with me, but he wouldn't tell me what he wanted me and how he wanted me to construct this, this whole sitting with you today. And that comes home and she says, do you want me to leave you alone? And I said, no, I want your company. So, so she sat with me and we ended up watching a uh, television show from PBS series, The All Creatures Great and Small. I don't know whether you know what that is. It's neither here nor there. Nice show, nice series. And in the middle of it, the Lord says, you think that the thing that I, you think that your Moses and when you do something wrong, you're gonna be left behind. You think you're Israel, and when you've done something wrong, you won't enter into the promised land. You think you live from a place of unbelief and you live under my curse. What was happening? See, I don't know I live in a place, and we all live in a place of blindness with the, with the things that the enemy has placed in our heart that we are operating out of that we don't realize is the core thing that's there. So the Lord was saying to me, that's wrong. And instantly when I, I, you know how the Lord can like in a fraction of a second give revelation and, and it's like a fraction of a second long, but to tell what he's just done takes a half an hour to unpack. Well, that's the way that this was. The point of the Lord was, okay, Tom, don't you go there as the smart one, you know, sitting on a, on a pedestal and you've got all the Bible figured out. You go to them and you tell them that I'm the smart one and I'm the only one that can unsort the tangled mess that there is in people's hearts after they're saved. Because my people aren't walking in the fullness of, of, of being connected to me. And I am strong, I'm burning with a passion and a desire to meet my people in the place where I can untangle their hearts. You and I have been saved, yet we don't operate in the fullness and the, of the place of the Lord, in the full intimacy with the Lord. The Lord is, abs, is, act, is, is putting his finger on that. He does not want that. His consuming desire is to bring us into a place where we are released from the veils that the enemy has put into you and me and bring us into closer and closer intimacy and fullness of joy and life. Do you feel it? Do you feel the pull of the Lord that he wants to bring us into that place? Well, if you feel the pull, that's the whole point. So the, so 
So he's calling us into the place where, where we need to understand we, we don't have anything to offer. The exchange at the cross is always my crappy life and the things that are crappy, and I get all the good stuff from him. It's a wonderful proposition. He wants us to realize that we come as we are, and he changes us. But that's the life. That's the place of humility. He wants to teach us in the garden. He wants to work on marital, mar marital intimacy with you and I. He wants to strengthen that. He wants to work on the marriage. He wants us to come to him. This is how the bride is cleansed, not in us. I'm holy because Jesus in me is holy. As I do that, I come into this place where I can't, where I start to become like the woman who worked for me. I can't keep my mouth shut. He is so good. He is amazing. I enter into worship like here today, and, and, and everything in me is being connected because that connection has been worked on in the secret place with the Father where he's removed chaff, and now in a place of worship, I can amen and enter in fully into his presence in worship. He loves that. He's cultivating his garden. His garden is you and me. We participate in that by taking the things that we see that are not right, not hiding them, but taking them to him and having him remove them. He then, that's what Je Jesus looked like, wheat with no chaff. Jesus basically says, Satan has nothing in me. And that's where he's bringing you and me. I'm done. I'm done. I'm 10 minutes over. But I have no fear that I'm going to get punished. <laughs> so what do we do with this? There's, there's altars where the Lord asks us to come to him and we recognize that there's places that need to be addressed. Those are altars. The, the, the uh, Ruth coming into Boaz, literally the threshing floor became an altar. She gave him her life and he accepted it and, and became one with her. Well, there's an altar internally. So, if, if, you, if this resonates with you and you feel like it's the leading of the Lord and you want to step into it, then you tell him personally in your secret place, you have it. It's not that you have to discover it. It's already there. That place where you meet him, lay down your failures and your frustrations and all of the things that you feel like you can't do for God and you wish you could and be honest with him, just like you were at the day when you were saved. The way in is the way on. And then watch him work. Have an expectation that, that, that he will work. Mix your faith with it. The faith that who he is, he's the faithful one, that if you and I confess our sins, he is faithful to forgive us cleanse us all over again. I'm reminded of Napoleon Dynamite. I don't think that's appropriate. Where he's where he's gotten with, with his friend and and if if you if you vote for Pedro, then all of your needs and your wildest expectations in life are going that's hilarious. Well, we're not gonna vote for Pedro, but we're gonna step into the places where we feel like our heart's been tugged on by the Spirit of God and meet him there. Then in the co-participation of it, if he 
So it is hearing him. You've, you're hearing him. If, you, if, that, if there's a tug on your heart, the Shema, Deuteronomy verses, chapter 6, verses 4 through 6. If you hear him, step into him, and then co-labor. And, and, and if he's asking you and me to give something up, to be a co-laborer in those things, then step that way. Now, if you fail, you come back to him and say, I need more. I need more because I'm not, I'm, I don't want to accept this condemnation from this new failure of trying to cultivate my garden and co-participate with you. Uh, that's, I know that's not what you want. So I'm coming back to you. I'm asking you for more. You continue to come back to him. Let me tell you what literally happens. It is a place where your heart, the core of you is changed. And the things that are operating from the throne room of God, from that place of the secret place of the most high, starts to become affected and there's changes and there's an ease of stepping into things that you could not do before. I, I hope you've had fun. So that's everything. Anyway, it's, it's him. And you are, I, I just bless you as his children, as his beloved, as his bride, as the one who is absolutely crazy about. But he's so crazy about you that he's not willing to leave you in a place where you don't have full and abundant life. He is pursuing you for fullness of life. So his blessings upon you. Amen. Vote for Pedro. <laughs> That's great.